now, this is such a good movie that isn't being advertised very well. I mean, the trailer caught a lot of people's eye, but they didn't give you a good idea as to what the movie's about. What a, what a story. What a true story. And how well the movie is made. This is... I would say this is this is like a Scorsese-style film. Think Goodfellas, Casino, The Departed, The Irishman. I've been watching a lot of Scorsese again lately during the quarantine. And this is very, very much inspired by that and stands right alongside it. But instead of, instead of this being a story about the mafia, and a lot of Scorsese stories also were based on real events, as this is. But instead of the mafia, we're talking about social activist groups in the late 1960s, like the Black Panther Party versus the FBI. And fascinatingly and tragically, there are a lot of similarities to mafia stories here. It's also fascinating. Oh, when you think about where we are now and how far we still have to go, but how far we've come. Early on in the movie, Fred Hampton, I love this movie, Fred Hampton is talking about talking to his disciples about war versus politics. And he describes politics as war, but without bloodshed. And that made me think about how Stacey Abrams, who was just nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and when you think about it in the context of that, that description, that totally even more makes sense, but Stacey Abrams' recent huge political victory and her mobilization of black voters and how that was so successful and was built on the actions and ideas of civil rights leaders like Fred Hampton. Now, again, as I said, this is a true story, a true story which everyone should know. And it's about the complex civil rights movement right after the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, where new leaders were trying to emerge and how the FBI was trying to stop that from happening. Uh, and this is very interesting to me because when I reviewed Trial of the Chicago 7, I pointed out, we'll talk about Trial of Chicago 7 a little bit later in this review because these, these stories happen at the same time. But I said, oh, I clearly, you know, protest movements need leaders. And some of you in the comments pointed out, well, Grace, leaders, a lot of bad things happen to leaders, which is why some people are very reluctant to step up. And this is an exploration of that. And it just goes, and it also shows how, you know, thank goodness we have social media today and I think a little bit more of an aggressive press because what J. Edgar Hoover is able to get away with here and through the FBI is just so despicable and underhanded. Like we knew J. Edgar Hoover had problems and was bad, but you know, just to see the scope of what he did is just incredible and horrific. It's also a story of incredible betrayal, drawing a parallel between William O'Neill and Judas, the disciple who betrayed Jesus, is not only a powerful comparison, but accurate. My jaw dropped seeing the extent of what William O'Neill does here. I'm not going to give anything away. You just won't believe it. It was like, it was like almost Shakespearean in the tragedy. What makes for, and that makes for a very brave performance by Lakeith Stanfield, a man, he's playing a man not just lying to others, but himself. There are brilliant little moments in this performance here. Director Shaka King and Stanfield give us just glimpses of uh, when O'Neill can't help but smile to himself, thinking he's so clever. I thought those were beautiful. They're so well done. And they're, they're, it was just, it was just, you're like, someone might see you smiling, like, but he just can't help himself because he feels he's just so mischievous and he's doing such a great job. But he has no idea where this path is going to ultimately take him and everyone else. And on that same level that Stanfield is able to play a, a Judas character like this and still make him sympathetic. Oh my God. Like what a nuanced and dynamic performance. Wow. And also that I want, I want to again underscore what, you know, that wouldn't be possible without excellent direction by King and writing by Will uh, Burson and King together. Uh, both might have been involved in Hollywood for over a decade or almost a decade, but they have not done very much to date. And I always tell you, it's a marathon, not a sprint. But these guys clearly stayed in the game, paid attention to what was going on around them. And now that they have their shot, they have delivered a movie that feels like it was made by seasoned professionals. It's incredible. Ryan Coogler produces here, and he continues to not just be talented himself, but clearly has an incredible eye for talent in others. And to be fair, I want to be fair here, the Lucas brothers had the idea of making a movie about what happened to Fred Hampton in the first place. It was their idea, and they received story credit here. So they were still, you know, they're still somewhat involved with the production. And this is a film full of great performances beyond Stanfield. While Daniel Kaluuya is 10 years older than Fred Hampton was at this time, 
And that's, you know, the only problem there is that you don't realize when you're watching the movie just how young Hampton was, which itself is also incredible. But still, that's a minor thing. Kaluuya's performance is not only mesmerizing, but different than anything else we've ever seen from Kaluuya before. And when you think about how Daniel Kaluuya is British, this is like a transformation acting-wise that's like Christian Bale level. It's that impressive. What Hampton was able to accomplish through just words and first force of personality is amazing. And you can understand, tragically, again tragically, such a tragic film, why Hoover's FBI was th so threatened by him. And it's, you know, to think that the history books have largely erased Fred Hampton. Thank goodness for this movie to bring him back like this. Uh, Kaluuya makes that power that Hampton had palpable. Also, Judas and the Black Messiah is very fair to the Black Panther Party. It's a complex situation, which the movie makes you understand. It doesn't shy away from some of the horrible violence of the members of the Black Panther Party, but also it shows that that, that violence was spurred on by violence, horrible violence by the police. You know, you had very much of a situation back then that we're still dealing with today with Black Lives Matter. And, you know, that's why it's interesting to see the evolution of the Black community you know, confronting this and trying to deal with it. And, you know, I think that also further underscores the success that Stacey Abrams, Abrams has had breaking through. And also how the FBI waged a mis misinformation campaign to discredit the Black Panther Party, uh, which, by the way, I think still ha has effect today when, when most people think back what they've heard of the Black Panther Party. It's shocking here to see just how successful the FBI was in, in, in discrediting it and reinterpreting it as something it clearly wasn't. I mean, that's really, again, tragic. I mean, the Black Panther Party was largely peaceful and only took up weapons in what they felt was self-defense. And in some cases here, you can see that's a valid argument. Uh, you watch this movie and you feel, I mean, obviously you can't go after the police like that, but you know, what are we going to do about the fact that the police are, do, are doing things that are, are, you know, should be illegal. And you know, that's even a conversation we're having today. And you watch this movie and you see how talented Fred Hampton was politically. And it's just so horrible that at the time nobody, and thank goodness we have made some progress in this regard, because you do have politicians like Stacey Abrams, that nobody was willing, or even if they were willing to, they weren't able to approach Fred Hampton and legitimize the Black Panther Party, which clearly had so many wonderful ideas and was the foundation for many of today's movements. Uh, instead of the eye for an eye situation that developed in Chicago, uh, which was just horrific and tra again, tragic. By the way, this movie takes place, as I said, at the same time and place in Chicago as Netflix's Trial of the Chicago 7. In fact, Fred Hampton is even a minor character who shows up briefly in that film. Both are excellent movies, but the Trial of the Chicago 7 plays more like a courtroom play, like in the theater. Um, well, Judas and the Black Messiah is far more cinematic. So I really feel that this movie, you know, if Trial of the Chicago 7 does better awards-wise, it's strictly on Aaron Sorkin's reputation, you know, over the, over the years. But I think Judas and the Black Messiah, I love both movies. I love both movies, but I think Judas and the Black Messiah is a little bit better. Uh, but boy, Chicago sure was a mess back then. Wow, it's just horrible what was happening there. In addition to Stanfield and Kaluuya, who Warner Brothers is putting forward for Best Actor and Best Supporting Actor, respectively, Jesse Plemons, love Jesse Plemons, and he once again is amazing here, playing um, an equally complex role as O'Neill's FBI handler, who finds himself under tremendous pressure from outside forces, but also makes some pretty horrible choices all on his own. And also there's, uh, he's great, he's so good. I love Jesse Plemons. And then Dominique Fishback. I loved her in Project Power. I gave her a great review there. I said she really, you know, stood out. And she graduates here to a much more adult role uh, and she does a wonderful job. I thought she was fantastic. And then Marvel's new Riri Williams, a lot of you are asking me about her. She does appear here, but she has a very small role. But she certainly makes an impression. She did the most with what she had. And then Lil Ray Howery has a cameo he has such a good cameo. You know, it's funny. It's this very small role. It's one scene, but he was incredible. I was like, that's Lil Ray. And then I was like, he's, he's doing an amazing job. This is a great part. This is a great cameo. 
It was very Scorsese. I really liked this movie. And again, on that note, while he's not on camera, Shaka King really delivers here, both as the writer and as the co-writer. And he's early on in his career. Imagine what he's going to be able to do the next few outings when he starts to get some experience under his belt. I mean, he's incredible. It's only his second feature. Some franchise is going to snap him up quick. And again, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up directing Ryan Coogler's upcoming Wakanda show on Disney Plus if he's not, if he, he might very well end up being the showrunner there or on something. Someone's going to get him fast. He's incredible. So that's my review of Judas and the Black Messiah. It hits theaters and HBO Max on February 12th. Don't miss it. It's really, really good. If you like those kind of Scorsese movies, you're going to love this. So don't miss it. As again, as I said, don't miss it. Share those thoughts down below. Subscribe today. And of course, as always, you can check out some more videos right now.